Good evening, everyone. All right, good evening. Welcome, 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 welcome to our second, excuse me, distinguished lecture of the AUC Art Collective. My name is Cheryl Finley and I'm the inaugural director and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dr. Lee Rayford's lecture this evening. I'd like to begin with a number of thank yous because there's so many people whose help and support has made this evening possible. I'd like to be begin with, I'm sorry, I am running over my words this evening. Let me pause for a moment. Okay, I would like to begin with Rachel Brown, our program manager who is standing here. I'm in the back of the room. Thank you so much, Rachel and Lauren Harris, our program coordinator who probably checked you in. Um, and also I want to acknowledge the AUC Art Collective majors and minors. Thank you all so much for coming out today, for being so enthusiastic about our program and your studies. And also thank you for joining us for lunch this afternoon with Dr. Rayford. I also wish to acknowledge the Department of Art and Visual Culture, faculty and staff, and our partners at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art and the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum as well as Morehouse College Partners and the Woodruff Library. Without your resources and support, we would not be able to do the work that must be done and that we're so excited and committed to doing. I also wish to acknowledge the Social Justice Scholars and Dr. Cynthia Neal Spence, as well as Comparative Women's Studies and Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftel. Thank you for your support. I wish to acknowledge as well our, our fearless leader, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, president of Spelman College, and really the person who is behind the AUC Art Collective and someone that um, we are so happy to have um, as our leader here at Spelman and at the Atlanta University Center. I wish to acknowledge uh, Dwight and Iris Rayford and their friends and family, and when they walk in, if I'm still talking, I'm going to acknowledge them too, put them on the spot. Um, they live here in Atlanta, and we're so happy that um, Lee is here with us and with them for the weekend. And finally, I wish to thank the Alice L. Walton Foundation for your support of the AUCR Collective. We're so, so happy uh, for, for your support. And of course, we could not do this without you. And again, I wish to acknowledge Dwight and Iris Rayford. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us Lee. So before I, um, I introduce Lee and, and talk about her, she's a dear friend and a colleague and someone I love very, very much. I also just want to point out um, this beautifully designed card. Um, this card advertises and tells you just a little bit about our program or the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. I know that there are a number of majors and minors here in the room with us this evening. If you're not a major or a minor and you're interested in signing up, please see Rachel Brown or Lauren Harris or me after the lecture. We have so much to offer in terms of the course of study as well as scholarships for eligible students and also uh, summer internship support as well. So it's a great new initiative here on all three campuses of the AUC and we encourage you all to join us in this amazing journey in the years and decades to come. I also want to point out just a couple of things that are happening um, as part of our, uh, our weekly, if not monthly, calendar and program of events. Um, as most of you know, we are, are very busy all the time. We like to support all the really important and amazing things that are happening here at the AUC as well as in Atlanta. And uh, one thing that I'd like to point out that we will be supporting this weekend as part of our February calendar of events is the Georgia Incarceration Project dance performance, and that's taking place here at Spelman College this weekend on Saturday and Sunday, um, and that is something that has been spearheaded by uh, Dr. and Professor Julie Johnson, who is here in the dance department at Spelman College. Um, it's, it's a really, really powerful um, and important project. Um, I also would like to point out that our next uh, distinguished uh, lecturer will be Dr. Deborah Willis, um, who hails from uh, NYU in New York, uh, a distinguished uh, artist, photographer, and scholar of photography. And her lecture will take place next month on the 3rd of March. Um, and that will be in the auditorium in the Olivia O. Hanks Cosby building. Um, 
And uh, please uh, make sure that you join our mailing list if you haven't already. And um, follow us on Instagram if you're not doing that already. Um, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot to show and share. So I want to say a few things about my dear friend, Dr. Lee Rayford. We went to graduate school together at Yale just a few years ago. Um, but I just want to say she's a generous scholar. She is a collaborative scholar. At lunchtime today, she talked to us about her, her work and the need to collaborate, how it is an imperative of the kind of scholarship that she does, the kind of engaged scholarship that she does across the disciplines. She's also an adventurous scholar. Uh, her most recent field study uh, includes Bamako, Mali, where she attended a photography biennial for research, Mexico City, and then most uh, coming up this spring, she'll be traveling to London um, and also to Cape Town, South Africa. Again, this is uh, not just part of a sort of a fun tour, but really she's very uh, committed to field study, to meeting with people, to connecting with people, to collaborating with artists and curators and scholars and students and activists as well. And I, I want to underscore that uh, Dr. Rayford really um, embodies the kind of scholar that we, we want you to also aspire to be um, as members of the AUC Art Collective um, because of the way in which she is able to connect people across disciplines, across continents, um, through art, uh, through African American studies, um, and through her passion and through her wisdom as a mentor. Um, she's really the type of person that we're so happy to have here today. She talked to us this afternoon um, about her scholarship and sort of the way that she became interested in some of the things that she writes about and studies. And I think you'll notice that there's a common theme, at least for the spring semester uh, selections of our distinguished scholars. They're both scholars of photography. Um, and we did that uh, perhaps, of course, uh, because at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, we have an exhibition of the work of Theaster Gates, um, which focuses on the Johnson Publishing Company archives and also the curatorial practice and how we can also think outside of um, sort of traditional ways of, of conducting curatorial practice. And so we wanted to have engaged scholars like Dr. Rayford here, not only to talk about her own work, but also to have the ability to in, engage with what we have on view for, um, for you here this semester. Um, but also during the, the lunchtime uh, conversation, Dr. Rayford talked very much about her practice as one that is engaged in dismantling and decolonizing white supremacist visuality, that she's very interested in transforming and innovating curatorial practice. And this is something that she does by way of social justice and also by way of involving her students. And I would say that you're already doing this, Lee. You've been doing it for a really long time. In fact, um, I think I, I interjected in one of the questions that was asked to say that you have been a collaborative scholar, I think, from the very, very beginning. And that's probably very much the way that your parents um, also raised you, um, the way that you, you collaborate with people um, because you want to. Uh, so I want to say just a little bit about um, Lee's, Lee's background. Um, she uh, received her BA um, in African American Studies and Women's Studies from Wesleyan College and her MA and PhD from Yale University in American Studies and African American Studies. That, that was a, an interdisciplinary PhD. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Oh, you've been there for a decade. Oh, I'm sorry. African American Studies. What did I say? Amer American Studies, I'm sorry, African American Studies. I knew that, I knew that. She's been the chair of the Department of African American Studies and you've been there for a, a decade. It's coming up on a decade in, in yeah, wow. That, oh, right, 16 years. That's including tenure, okay. So, so the other thing um, that, that Lee is very distinguished um, with is the number of fellowships and grants that she has received over the years. She's received a, a fellowship from the Volkswagen Foundation uh, actually twice um, to work on uh, collaborations with colleagues including myself and Dr. Heike Rafael Hernandez 
Um, she's also received a number of other uh, scholarships, including one from the American Council of Learned Societies. That was a collaborative research uh, grant uh, in which I was also involved. And then she's also received uh, support from the Ford Foundation um, and others, including the Woodrow Wilson uh, Foundation, very early on in her career. And I can't stress enough how important it is that these kinds of uh, scholarships and, and, and forms of support help us to do our work and give us the time to think freely and clearly about the kinds of projects we wish to engage in. Um, the other thing that I want to say about Lee is the kind of work that she does um, at Berkeley. She teaches and researches about race, gender, justice, and visuality. She's the author of several acclaimed uh, uh, works, uh, not only articles um, and essays on art, photography, and American studies, but also books that look at the civil rights movement through photography. And I just want to name a couple of her distinguished works here. Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, Photography and the African American Freedom Struggle. And this is a book that I would say is essential reading for anyone who is studying in the American South and at the Atlanta University Center. She's also co-editor with Heike Rafael Hernandez of Migrating the Black Body, Visual Culture and the African Diaspora, and with Renee Romano of the Civil Rights Movement in American Memory. She's written essays about the work of a number of contemporary African-American artists, including Lava Thomas, Mildred Howard, and Dawood Bey. And most recently, she co-curated the group shows Plumline, Charles White, and the Contemporary at the California African-American Museum in Los Angeles with Essence Hardin, and also About Things Loved, Blackness and Belonging at the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive. And that was something that she did as part of a class that she was teaching at Berkeley. So I think I'm going to stop talking now because we've already started a little bit later than we wanted to or thought we were going to. And I would like to invite Dr. Rayford up here to the podium and we are looking forward to your talk this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do silence your phones. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for that beautiful introduction and also for years of friendship and collegiality and support. Um, I've learned so much from you, um, traveling with you, thinking with you. Um, I also want to thank um, my parents and my family um, and my dear friends who are here tonight. Um, it's really lovely. Even though I grew up in Harlem, it seems like most of my life has moved to Atlanta. Um, so that's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I also just want to thank um, Rachel Brown, Lauren Harris, Ann Smith, and Zynga Simmons um, uh, for taking care of me today, for um, showing me all of the really rich resources on campus. Catherine Kelvin for opening up her classroom this morning. Um, I, and I really just want to thank the students who've come out. I know many of you are here because uh, you want that extra credit, and I'm, I feel that. Um, I hope that I will keep you awake. Um, I will do my best to, to, to do so. Um, but also, I'm just incredibly impressed by the conversations that I've had with you all today and just kind of how sharp, how exciting, um, and how innovative you and committed you are to this field, which um, I think for so long has been really just held down by a, a small number of people and the fact that you are able to kind of move in and take ownership of it um, and, and put your stamp on it is really, really phenomenal. So I really applaud you. Um, so the, the work I'm presenting um, tonight centers around um, a family photo album compiled by former Black Panther Party Communications Secretary Kathleen Neal Cleaver. Um, the album chronicles the years that uh, Cleaver and her husband, writer and party minister of information, Eldridge Cleaver, and their two children, Maceo and Joju, lived in Algeria as exiles uh, from the United States in the years 1969 to about 1973. Um, the album is one, um, oh, here we go, uh, is one particularly rich object in um, Cleaver's personal photographic archive, um, which is um, I've been working with um, for the last few years. Um, so since November, since about November 2016, 
I've been working on and with Cleaver's photographic archive and the album in particular in two um, distinct and but interrelated ways. And I think in many ways this resonates with, um, is, or is at least in dialogue, with a really phenomenal Black Image Corporation exhibition curated by Theaster Gates that's at the Spelman Art Museum. Um, so first, um, so the first of the two ways, as a as an archivist and principal investigator, um, I've been co coordinating a small team of photographers, scholars, and students working with Cleaver uh, to identify, organize, catalog, and digitize what we're calling the Eldridge and Kathleen Cleaver Family Photographic Archive. And I really want to recognize the work and recognize um, uh, the the folks that have been working with on this project, some of whom are here tonight. Um, so many of you might, might recognize um, Sierra King, um, John Stevens made his photographs, and Leah Bascom. Yeah, please, I would like you to stand up um, and be acknowledged for this inc the incredible amount of work that you've done. Um, and this is, these are just some images of the, that John has made of the, the of our time working um, on the on the archive, um, and if you've been to the Spelman Art, Muse Art Museum and been to Black Image Corporation, you'll recognize those white gloves. Um, it's important. Um, and then, secondly, as a scholar, I've been researching and writing about the Algiers album, as I'm calling it, and it's going to be I'm envisioning it as part of a, a, a book in progress that is tentatively titled, or I should say today's title, is um, When Home is a Photograph, Belonging, Photography, and Blackness in the World. And it's a project that explores how a range of photographic genres have performed different kinds of work um, and sort of thinking through how black, black folks, African Americans especially, have elaborated a, collection, a connection to the global black world across the 20th century. Um, so my talk is tonight is going to proceed in two parts. First, I'll spend a little bit of time describing the archiving project and its larger significance, um, and then I'll turn to the album itself. So uh, about four years ago, um, Kathleen Cleaver contacted me to ask her help, ask my help in inventorying her personal archiving archive and imagining and implementing its future uses. And so when you get an email from um, Kathleen Cleaver, you, you, know, you pay attention. Um, <laughs> Um, so Kathleen and I had um, met, we knew each other when we overlapped uh, at Yale while she was a, when she was a law professor there, um, law and African American studies. I was a graduate student, as you heard. She knew a little bit about some of my work um, on photography in the Black Panther Party, including a chapter from my book, um, Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, that focuses um, on, especially around the iconization of her image. Um, and of Panther images uh, largely. And from these and a few other encounters over the years, she thought I'd be a good person to take this project on. Um, someone who's knowledgeable about the history of, of the party, um, knowledgeable about the affective charge of the photographic image and the entanglement of the two. Um, and so I'm in, in, in November 2016, I made my first visit uh, to her home here in Atlanta, and I've been working with it since. Um, and as you know, uh, 2016 also marked the 50th anniversary of the party, the Black Panther Party. Um, uh, found arguably the most influential, thank you, sorry. Uh, arguably the most influential black power organization in U.S. history. And so with that, we've seen a surge of books and exhibits examining the party's history and its legacy, highlighting its programming, its gender politics, and its imagery. Um, but we also know that as these histories come out, that there are actually more archives, um, more stories that are yet to be uncovered, um, and more collections that are coming to light. And certainly Kathleen Cleaver's is one of those collections. Um, so Kathleen joined the party in late spring 1967 and was soon thrust into the maelstrom created by the incarceration of party founder Huey P. Newton that fall. She rose to prominence as one of the party's key leaders and organizers, um, and as well as one of Black Power's most recognizable icons. Um, researchers currently have limited access to 
uh, or access to a limited number of um, Eldridge Cleaver's papers. I, um, I'm fortunate uh, at UC Berkeley, the Bancroft Library actually holds um, one of the larger collections of, of Eldridge's papers, um, but even fewer of Kathleen's. Um, and, and we know that there are very few accessible archives of women in the party um, and women in black power more broadly. Um, Angela Davis's papers were recently acquired by Harvard University and that's, that's incredibly important. Um, but there's still a kind of, um, uh, there aren't a lot out there. And so Kathleen Cleaver's collection is incredibly unique. Um, but more than that, Kathleen is herself a unique figure in black social movement history. She was a, a third generation African American college student. She lived with her family in Asia and Africa before finishing high school, uh, dropping out of Barnard, don't drop out of school, um, and joining first the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and then the Black, uh, Black Panther Party. Kathleen's father, Dr. Ernest E. Neal, was a professor of sociology. Um, and her mother, Pearl Jewett Johnson Neal, was the first African American woman to earn an advanced degree in mathematics from the University of Michigan. Jewett's father, J. Spurgeon Johnson, also held advanced degrees, and Jewett's uncle, Charles, Charles Spurgeon Johnson, was the first black president of Fisk. Um, so in 1948, when Kathleen was three, the family moved from Dallas to Alabama, where Ernest took up a post as, as, um, at Tuskegee. And then in 1954, Ernest joined the U.S. Foreign Service. And over the next half dozen years, the Kath, um, this is, I love this picture of Kathleen's passport um, at, at 10, right? Um, Ernest joined the U.S. Foreign Service, and over the next half dozen years, the family lived in India, the Philippines, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, countries each um, newly independent or working to throw off the shackles of colonialism. Photographs in the collection document the Niels family's participation in black and brown nation building and transnational freedom dreaming, um, contributing to administrative meetings, hosting diplomatic events, attending schools with students of many colors and cultures. Um, so the catalog, the, the collection is vast and wide. Um, it's, covers um, the period, it's sort of rich in the period of the Panther, the Panther Party, um, but it also, in terms of the photographs, there are about 2,000 images and counting. Um, the photographic component, let's see, um, includes snapshots and formal um, portraits, um, uh, contact sheets and family albums, photographs made by professional photographers, amateurs and Cleaver herself. They include posters, flyers, and book and magazine clippings and outtakes, um, and more than a dozen photo albums made by Kathleen, her mother Jewett, her aunt Dorothy Johnson, um, an avid traveler, um, and Ger Geronimo Pratt, who was uh, uh, also a Panther who was falsely uh, accused, uh, incarcerated for 27 years. The photographs date as far back as the late 19th century, um, starting with two lithographic transfers of Cleaver's grandparents and include a sizable collection of the Neal and Johnson families. So taken together, um, and it also includes um, uh, photographs detailing the afterlives of the party. Um, and I think this is, this is you know, very key. So the, the archive will add significantly to our scholarship of the Black Panther Party specifically um, and of black Americans abroad. It foregrounds questions of gender politics and family, of internationalism and diaspora. And I'm really honored um, to be working with the photographic collection. Um, but I think what's important also um, is that Kathleen was not only interested in my help in organizing the archive, but she also wanted to see how a researcher would and could make use of the collection. So
sat down to compile the family home. Though her children, Maseo and Joji, were now adolescents, there were no albums that gathered together photographs of their baby and early childhood. Maseo Eldridge Kluber was born in Algeria on July 29, 1969, a little over a month after Kathleen arrived there to meet Eldridge. Eldridge had fled the United States in late 1968 after engaging in a shootout that ended in the police slaying of 17-year-old Bobby Hutton, the Panthers' first recruit. Facing attempted murder charges, which would surely result in, the, in a death sentence from an ex-convict and outspoken radical, Eldridge jumped bail and fled first to Cuba and then Algeria. When Kathleen Embassy in LBR. 
and the subsequent move to France when the Algerian government had grown tired of the motley crew of hijackers that found their way at Aldridge in the RPCN. Kathy had carried the photographs, photographs she could from Algeria to France and eventually back to the US. But this represented only a small portion of a much larger archive, reportedly uh, lost in the move. I was livid, she recalled, because one of the biggest trunks we had in Algeria was filled with books and photographs. I had made arrangements for someone to ship it, but it never, but they never made it. The CIA took it, she wrote. French intelligence or US intelligence had it. For the repository and assemblage, Lika chose a very unremarkable or the standard album intended for scrapbooking. About 14 by 11 inches with marble dark green covers containing beige paper pages to which snaps and scraps could be affixed with glue. And there, in the relative calm of her new Haven apartment, no longer parenting two children under the age of five, no longer living as a declared enemy of the U.S. state in fear of her husband being extradited, extradited in prison and assassinated, Kathleen Cleaver assembled and memorialized the story of their family's years living in Algeria. The album is composed largely of photographs that others made of the Cleavers, with some images made by Aldridge. Amateur snaps, snapshots by visiting friends and supporters, professionally made images taken by the photographers and photojournalists, outtakes and stills from the um, uh, RPCN made guerrilla propaganda films that Eldridge referred to as voodoo, commissioned gov government portraits executed by various second and third world state employees in Vietnam, China, North Korea, and the People's Republic of the Congo, as well as Algiers. The range of photographs was initially attended, intended for state diplomacy and propaganda, for reproduction in the Black Panther newspaper, um, later in publications like Voice of the Lump Band, Right On, Babylon, and other radical media, uh, movement media outlets, for movement mobilization and fundraisers, or for inclusion in other people's family albums. But now they were being curated by Cleaver in a nondescript, mass produced album to tell the quotidian story of a family living under most extraordinary circumstances. So while this photography collection has great political and historical significance, it is perhaps best understood as a family archive. Um, and as I said, this album enriches our knowledge and contributes significantly to growing, growing scholarship, um, particularly the international section of the Black Transit Program. Um, and it does so through the specific lens of a black woman author text. So uh, one of the questions that I, I ask is, is what does family photography as a genre and the specific form of a family photo album reveal, what is it to limit? What does it make possible? How does photography make a home? Um, Bell Hooks has reminded us that family photography, portraits, snapshots, and albums held a place of significance for many Jim Crow era Amer African American families as they sought to carve spaces of validation and recognition. And this was no less true for Kathleen's family. Family portraits, and documentation were important to the Neal and Johnson families, no matter their geographic locations, whether the American South or the Global South. My family always had pictures, Kathleen emphasized. My mother had photos and albums. When I was growing up, pictures were accessible to everyone, especially with Brownie cameras, the, the easy to use camera invented by Kodak in 1900. Um, Kathleen is particularly proud of the commissioned family portrait by famed African-American photographer P.H. Pope at his Tuskegee studio. So the collection as a whole and the Algiers album specifically provide insight into a life marked by diaspora in its many iterations and constellations, transnationalism, pan-Africanism, migration, exile. And indeed, the concept of diaspora is a complex one that at its heart wrestles with the idea of family. It embodies a tension between, between home and unbelonging. It figures attachment and deferral and deferred elsewhere. For those, um, so in family becomes a contentious, even though it's a contentious term, becomes a key mode for understanding diaspora, and especially for people who have never met and may share little beyond chosen identification. So what kind of story does a family album tell? How can a family album help us understand the fullness and complexities 
the failures and promises of blackness in the world? How might it teach us to read and see black radicals in other ways? To read and see black women's lives in other ways? Increasingly, I've come to think of the work of Cleaver's Capacious Family Photography Collection and the Algiers album Through the Lens of Purity and the Pure Children. And in recent years, it has become popular, and some might say overused, or play out, even, to call something curated, right? I feel like there are a lot of commercials now. The curated selection of hotels, and the curated this, the curated that. Um, and equally, though, I think there is a fetishization of the figure of the curator. And both terms have come to stand in for an individual brand, rather than a community-based practice. Naming Kathleen's work as curatorial has offered, for me, I think, an umbrella term for author, leader, activist, caregiver, and icon. By curatorial, I mean the process of selecting, organizing, arranging, and looking after the items in the collection. I am referring as well to the necessity of collaborating with others, especially artists, to realize a community, or what Bell Hooks might call a home place. I'm thinking here of what it means to build community with through, um, with and through art at the center. To hold space and engender a sense of belonging, knowingly impermanent and contingent, ephemeral but no less real. And also, the curatorial is a means of developing, intervening in, or controlling the narrative. In these meetings, my use of curatorial returns the role of curator to its Latin root curare, as a practice and model of caretaking. Kamio Kua, the current director of Zeiss Museum of Contemporary African Art in Cape Town, South Africa, and founder and former director of raw material company um, in Dakar, has described her curatorial practice um, in this way, and it offers a model for my own thinking. The curatorial is, quote, to defend sites of criticality and dreaming, to care for the health and vitality of our society, and to engage with new and undervalued artistic so I've been thinking about the album as curatorial. So I think we can first consider the photographs at the moment of the creation of the project of curating at home. As the family lived in exile and birthed and raised their children while also serving as US ambassadors for the global black liberation movement, photographs and photography demonstrate Kathleen's efforts of making a way and creating and holding a space for her children and community to thrive. Second, in the assemblage of the album in the early 1980s, we can see the work of curating memories, a commitment to documentation, a, re a registering of loss, an act of celebrating a time and place of her life that is gone, a marriage ending, a life to rest. The family album functions as both elegy and eulogy, and offers Cleaver another way to tell history. And finally, we might understand how things act of compiling the album and assembling the collection as one of curating photography. And here we come closest to the common uses of curating, as both caring for a collection and its tasteful selection. Um, thus, I would like to offer Kathleen's collecting and assemblage as creative acts of radical caretaking. And so, I'd like to turn to one particular photograph to draw us into the work of the curatorial. Um, and this is a, a black and white photograph of Maceo and Joju made in 1970 by visiting a panther photographer and close friend of the Cleavers, Jeff Jeffrey Bunford. So this is one of the few images in which Maceo and Joju appear alone together, without one or both of their parents, just siblings. They are nestled into a single chair, side by side, their arms touch. Even so, there is room to spare, which gives a greater view of the chair. Now, I'll turn to the chairs very few occupants in a moment. But let's first talk about the chair itself. It's a relatively straightforward piece of furniture. The seat and back of this carved chair, an early American design, is upholstered in zebra print. According to Kathleen, this, was, this chair was one of her favorites and featured prominently in the San Francisco home she shared with Eldridge from 1967 until she left to join him in Algiers. It was one of many African-themed items in their house. Animal prints, carved masks, shields, and, and spears. And of course, the zebra print is reminiscent, of course, of the iconic image of Katie P. Newton, right? Which is a photograph that was staged by Eldridge Cooper in May 1967. P. 
keenly aware of the power of image and power of personality, Kleefer felt it necessary to orchestrate a publicity photo photograph of Newton as the part of his gaining national and international attention after the takeover of the California Capitol building only a few days before this photograph was made. I described in my first book, in Prison of Women's Clare, how through its visual dramaturgy, the photograph captured and clarified many of the ambiguities and competing strains of black power that they appeared around the discourse. The African artifacts, the spears, the shields, the zebra skin rug, symbolized cultural nationalism, a philosophy defined by, defined by the glorified African past and the unifying force of monolithic black culture. Now knowing, however, that those artifacts, or replicas, as was more likely, came from the Cleaver's home, encourages us to think more carefully about how quotidian objects become powerful conduits in diaspora, diaspora creativity. In her essay, Back to Africa, The Evolution of the International Section of the Black Panther Party, 1969-1972, Kathleen wrote of the significance of such, a, of such connection, specifically in the context of the Panther delegation trip to Congo Brazzaville in 1972, this was a group yearning to be hailed as family by their African hosts. Kathleen writes, quote, the desire to return to Africa is always a powerful undercurrent in the Afro American experience. The hunger to see the land where their ancestors were captured and brought as slaves to America remain ever present among blacks struggling to express their identity in a white dominated world. The possession of diaspora resources, to use Jacqueline Brown's term, um, in one's home offers a sense of movement and mobility, an expression of connection across space and time, um, even, even, especially in, condi in a condition of immobility and stasis. The, the spears and shields and masks were items that one admired, like art and living. But the chair, a place of rest and momentary settling down, was something to be lived in. The centrality of the chair has implications, I think, for how we read the photography of black liberation at large. Um, scholar Tina Camp is instructed here. She follow, following um, scholar Kevin Kwashi, she urges us to consider quiet as a modality um, in her words that surrounds and infuses sound with impact and, and affect. The quotidian is a practice rather than an act, an action. As a heuristic, capacious enough acute enough to track refusal and not just resistance, stasis and not just mobility. In doing so, we were, we were able to rethink foundational approaches to diaspora studies. So on one hand, we can read this photograph from the album overall for a certain confirmation of these foundational approaches. That would mean considering it for its visualization of forced mobility of some of the most iconic figures of the black radical tradition. But the album also offers a depiction of homing that is itself a kind of aspiration to the quiet and stillness of the domestic quotidian that, that is an attention between rest and motion. Taken together, we are forced to contend with how, in Camp's words again, the black quotidian functions as a signature idiom of diaspora culture and black interior for even those who are the most recognizable most vocal and most resistant leaders in our political culture. Kathleen loved this chair so much that she had it shipped from San Francisco to Algiers. According to Kathleen, this photograph of the sale of Joju and Zuba Kerchen was made the day the shipment arrived from the States and into their second home in Algiers in the suburban area of Hadrian. They were unpacking the boxes and Kathleen placed the children in her favorite chair. The chair, we might say, is as much a subject of this photograph as the children. For the subject or citizen who lives under conditions of uncertainty and hostility, home is always in motion. It necessarily has to be here and elsewhere. It's respite and retreat that necessarily has to be mobile. Kathleen was no stranger to making a home internationally. She witnessed her parents, her mother especially, settled the family into living quarters in India, the Philippines, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. This un upbringing as ambassadors or agents of the Cold War United States was of course a far cry from living in exile as an enemy in the US. But one commonality for Kathleen is the need to create a familiar environment amidst persistent newness. 
This proved no easy task. While Captain writes that the Panthers were thrilled to be in Africa because of the place the continent held in its political and cultural imaginaries, the reality of living inside Gaza and the complexities of Algeria in particular made their experience a difficult one. Of the 30 Panthers living in Algiers at the height of the international section, only Kathleen spoke French, and no one spoke Arabic. None were able to comprehend the complex political situation or the histories that bound and divided Algeria's various ethnic, tribal, and religious groups. And for the women, as Kathleen remembered, quote, we came with our big hair and our big earrings and our short skirts, um, and quote, deeply iconic and celebrated in the U.S., but largely in transgression of expectations for modesty of female dress in Islamic Algeria. The exuberance for black liberation that brought the Panther contingent to Africa was dampened by their ignorance of Algeria. So returning to the photograph, we can see a kind of compl complicated color story at work in which the zebra print competes with the typical Islamic tile pattern of the floor. In the home which she loved and protected in San Francisco, you can think of that being the ballad of the bullet poster, the chair was meant to invoke an Africanist, a diasporic resource that imagined and thus forged a one-sided connection to an elsewhere beyond Babylon. Diaspora desire iterated through a material object. Now, in real Africa, real complicated. <laughs> the chair was a symbol of home and what was left behind. The photograph's elevation depicts an imagined Africa sitting atop a real home, an idea that hovers above solid ground, and both support her children. So let's return to the human subjects, the photograph persons of this image. Um, Joji on the left, left is less than a year old, her body is mushy, she has not too much of a little hair or teeth that we can tell. She appears new to the work of sitting up, and her position in the chair feels a bit precarious, um, as if she might slip over, slip, <laughs> tip over or slide off in the direction of her gaze, and anybody's trying to like, pose a child in the chair. Um, Indeed, she is a small human in motion. Her legs and feet disappear into a blur. The blur in turn casts a shadow over the sea. The same on the other hand is still, still enough. The finger of one hand and the smile of mouth. Um, and um, while the other hand holds onto the chair. At almost two years old, he looks directly at the camera with a kind of delight that suggests a growing knowledge of how to pose for the camera. Um, Jojo's blur and Maseo's smile, I think, remind us of the impulse to memorialize childhood and an idea of family by way of birth, but also the limits of such a prospect. And this is not just because children are notoriously difficult to photograph because they are generally incapable um, of or simply refuse to be still, but, um, uh, but the blur sort of think the, the cast a dark spot, a limit to visibility caused by a small body not fully in possession of itself. Um, the smile also sort of a happiness that uh, would prove fleeting and complicated. These two gestures open up for us consideration of different kinds of memorialization beyond commemoration or celebration into narrative forms that willingly or not allow for incompleteness, hold space for the unspoken and unsayable, and concede to the simultaneity of joy and trauma rather than one or the other. When I asked her, what prompted you to put the album together, Kathleen has no answer. However, in 1982-1984, Kathleen was writing her senior thesis in history at Yale, which she later published as one of the first academic volumes on Black Panther Party history. Um, the Black Panther Party we considered edited by um, a retired professor, Charles and Jones, um, and published in 1998. I think it's no accident that these two narratives of the previous time and exile emerged at the same time. And we may even think of them as mutually constitutive. Indeed, working with Kathleen over the, pa uh, over the past years, we've all witnessed the way memory affects and history adheres to individual photographs of her. The process of engaging with photographs, of holding them, looking at them, and to follow team account listening to them, has emerged as critical to Kathleen's narration of her own life. And I imagine this 
This touch, this hapticity, was as true in the 1980s as it is now. So the article, entitled Back to Africa, um, as I mentioned, offers a detailed overview of a facet of pamphlet history which, about which the world is very really good. Um, in the italicized preface to the essay, Cleo emphasized the difficulty of writing an underground history. Um, she couldn't find, found it difficult, ironically, to find the sources right, to support the evidence of an experience that she lived through. Right? Um, she intended to write, initially write a political foreign policy relations history, focusing on the unfolding drama of the Black Panther Party during this period. Um, but she couldn't find ample documentary support. Um, so evidence and official sources, because her first-hand knowledge, in a sense, did not count. Thus, she channeled her work into a narrative history with the hope that future scholars with greater access might delve further into the subject. So the, the writing style is, is scholarly, it's, you know, it's clear, it's direct. She doesn't shy away from what might be deemed controversial assertions, including that Huey Newton and David Hilliard, Hilliard may have been compromised by the FBI, but there's little in the way of, of sentimentality. Each of her conclusions are supported by evidence, buoyed by traditional uh, sources like newspaper and magazine articles, co-intelco documents, um, and oral histories. And of course, it's popular music. Like, you know, um, she doesn't mention family life, um, except to say that it was a, one of the series of complexities which they had to, um, which demanded a kind of creative response. So the children were there, they were, and day-to-day -day family concerns happened. But sometimes, and sometimes they got in the way of the real work of revolution, so how it feels. Um, and on the whole, I think, back to Africa, the essay recognizes how high the stakes are of recounting the history of the Black Panther Party, an organization still derided today as terrorists and thugs by local state and federal forces, and who is members of agent in prison, like Mumia Abu-Jamal, <coughs> or agent in exile, like Asada Shakur, for alleged crimes attached to their participation in the movement more than a generation ago. But I think juxtaposing the Algiers album with um, okay, the Algiers album with the thesis um, article helps us think more effectively about the question: What kind of story does a family photograph uh, tell? That the article is effective history, when the album offers affective history, and it offers an affective history, feeling history, which does not, cannot deny affect or bad, negative affect or bad attachments, like boredom, exhaustion, laziness, or betrayal. In doing so, it holds out the possibility of acknowledging the personal and political failures of the Cleaver's time in Reza. Failure without the political impulse of redemption, that in the words of diaspora studies scholar Liana Owen, are so central to the black left's revisionist narratives of existence. Um, the article teaches us but the album, as Owen would say, refuses to counsel us. So just to say a little bit more about that, in her study book project, A Manuscript in Progress, Ordinary Failure, Towards the Diasporic Ethics, Owen argues that the recitations of failure in diasporic memoirs by Zydia Hartman, Langston Hughes, Jamaica Kincaid, and others need to be attended to if we were to actually undo the binary of logics, logics of success and failure in which blackness is always on the losing side. And even when it's successful, only underscores the logics of anti-black racism. The failures here, though, that we are talking about are those in which black people, black people betray and cheat one another, misrecognize and refuse one another, shame and are ashamed of one another. One of the failures of that era, and I believe in much of our subsequent scholarship about the party, been a kind of oblique address, but ultimately redemptive narrative about gender relations. And one of the most one of the most egregious forms of interracial failure, sexual violence and domestic abuse. For the sake of time, I can discuss this in greater detail. But for now, I want to say I'm not, I'm not prepared to argue that Kathleen deliberately recites the failures of the international section and of herself and her family in the album in the way the memoirs do uh, own study. And indeed, I suspect that Kathleen her, is herself unprepared to make such an admittance. But I believe that the family album as a form is too messy, 
to obstruct us, to withhold, externalize, or deny entirely the failures and disappointments of familial relations. And I'm thinking here of family, family as it wants to be your nuclear family, the growing community of black American exiled families that lived under the Panther banner in Algiers, family as a metaphor for nationalism, and family as a map of intergenerational kinship and unaffected ties. So take, for example, a page that appears early in the album with only two remaining photographs from page chairs and blue stands. We know that a number of photographs have been removed. At the center, the right is a photograph of Kathleen in a mustard colored dress on a terrace overlooking Algiers. Close to the right edge of the frame, Kathleen's attention is not on the city view, but directed softly at the newborn in her arms. From the caption, captions to the left and beneath the image, Hotel 11 July 1969, and Pan African Cultural Festival, we can deduce that the baby is the same. Mother and child are in their own enclosed circle. Not only are they turned away from the city and the sea, um, turned towards each other, but they are also turned away from the photograph at the bottom of it, which presents a white presenting woman in a marine captain standing in front of a wall of flowers, smiling directly at the camera. Beneath the photograph, Kathleen has written friend, but on the image itself, Kathleen has drawn a thick cartoon mustache. She does not recall the woman's name, but recalls that this friend was, quote, in love with Eldridge, and made her way to Algiers to be close to him. In one retelling, Kathleen mentions that this was not the only friend who came to visit them in exile. It seems a memory that a scorned wife might want to forget or exile. Instead, Kathleen chose to include this photograph in her family album, and on the same page as his tender pieta, and to deface it in such a way that calls attention to a cascade of betrayals. As affective history, the Algiers al album offers an archive of feeling, to borrow Heather Love's term in the context of queer histories of loss and injury. Love writes, quote, taking care of the past without attempting to fix it means living with bad attachments, identifying with loss, allowing ourselves to be haunted. On this album page with its absent images and paper stars, Kathleen at once tends to her newborn baby while allowing the image of her husband's infidelities, marked by a boy the flat to be <laughs> in close proximity. Um, how am I doing this? Um, sorry. 
um, more than this, if we understand the, the family album as an act of communication, whose suspended conversations through those language terms are reawakened by subsequent engagements, then the genre allows for the possibility of different tellings each time it's opened. Um, the, and the tattered pages of loosely affixed photographs suggest as much. Here, in the Alger's album, nothing is fixed, not in the sense of having been cemented, nor of having been repaired. Indeed, any attempt to ask a meaning or to resolve the story only proves fruitless, only invites more questions than it might answer. The impossibility of holding the world child still or of keeping the other one happy alerts us to the impossibility of a closed or complete narrative. So let me turn one last time to this and uh, to consider the diasporic work of curing. While the children are seated in the chair and the chair rests on the tile floor, the image itself seems to float in the center of the album's page. The photograph sits on its own page, and no other images appear on the one facing it. It is clear that the photograph has been cut with the effect of emphasizing the chair and children and excising the room around them. Indeed, in another photograph from the series, from the same series, which Kathleen keeps framed on the piano in her living room, we see that Kathleen has excised herself. It's, um, now, it is Kathleen's own handwriting that disrupts the sense of the children in a universe of their own. Um, she's well identified the photograph as Jojo and Sale and just below it, Pedro 1970. She's provided a kind of brief anchor to the visual mirror. It's the cut and paste, the negative space, and Kathleen's handwriting that remind us of the work of assemblage and authorship of the album. But rather than artist or author, we can think of Kathleen's work as curatorial, the process of selecting, organizing, and arranging. Kathleen is herself a lover of photography and finally attuned to the power of the visual and social movements. When she began working with the party officially in November 1967, she created the position of communication secretary, but based on what I had seen Julian Bond do, there we go, During her time at Smith, where I sent out press releases, I got photographers and journalists to publish stories about us, I designed posters, but she never, she explicitly never put her name on the poster she created. As party communication secretary, it was Kathleen who enlisted husband and wife team, Purple Jones and Ruth Mary Baruch, to make intimate portraits of the Panthers and their supporters to counter the blustering, swaggering images circulating in the mainstream press. A commission that resulted in the book and photo exhibit Black Panther 1968 and in many ways set the terms for subsequent Panther portraiture. It was Kathleen who saw freelance photographer Jeffrey Blankford's photographs in the San Francisco newspaper and invited him to photograph the party. Gordon Parks' visit to Algeria that resulted and the iconic image of Kathleen and Alfred and Henry sparked a friendship with Kathleen and Parks until the latter's death in 2006. It was nurtured during the time that Kathleen's former longtime partner, documentarian Cynthia Bourne, produced Half Past Autumn, a film about Parks. Kathleen served on the board of the Board of Parks Foundation for many years and was honored by the foundation of the gala in 2016, which is where she met John. Um, so this lifelong penchant for identifying images and aesthetics she liked and transforming that enthusiasm into political commitment, I believe enables us to think about collecting, curation, and assemblage in potentially radical terms. That is, understanding the significance of visual representation to narrating one story. We might think of collecting as doing similar work. Though she very rarely took up the camera herself, that means knows that when I was in California, People kept taking pictures of me, so I started to collect them. Collecting photographs of herself as she watched herself become an icon, um, a phenomenon she was described as simply weird, um, <laughs> was a way of inventorying and asserting control over the proliferation of her own image. So the curatorial returns Kathleen is not to the center of her own narrative, but it, it reaffirms, her, reaffirms her architectural work. Her work as an organizer, as a collector, and also as a mother, a wife, a friend, a lover. And it, it enables us to celebrate her political, intellectual, and cultural labor while respecting her right to opacity. Caribbean philosopher Edward Bissant famously called for the right to opacity 
as a way to open space for the unknowable, as a means to challenge a life of thinking that one must be legible to be regarded as human. Reading the album as a curatorial project directs us to take seriously that which is cut and paste, cut and paste that which is marked and torn, removed and replaced. It opens a pathway to think about black women's leadership, organizing, and world building that holds the public and the private, the spoken and the withheld, not in opposition, but is complement with forces in the production of radical imagination. So by way of conclusion, I want to return to the intertwined work of making, organizing, and writing the archives of black women's lives. How do we tell the stories of black women's lives when the records are scant, if not non-existent? Misleading, if not outright lies, registers of the state or of capitalist domination that only invoke women, black women as fungible commodities. This work has felt incredibly urgent to me because we know they are there in the archives, that they are there in history because we are here. Black feminist scholars should urge caution in the archives, especially when it comes to centering the laws of black women's subjects. So Idea Hartman, Eva Taylor, Taylor Hunter, Tina Hanna, Daphne Brooks, Farrah Johnson Griffin, Sarah Haley, Melissa Fuentes, Francis Hammer, to name only a few, have taught us to read for, against, and with our kind of silence. They have taught us how to write through the development and employment of methodologies like reading against the bias frame or critical fabulation. And they have alerted us to the ways our own desires for such as agency and narrative wholeness are our most powerful and dangerous impulses. The Cleaver Archive reminds us of the rarity of such records, those made by and about black women themselves. And yet, such an archive still runs the risk of misinterpretation, especially when we us <coughs> uphold foundational and familiar stories of black life, stories that eschew complexity in favor of heroism, that smooth over contradiction for the sake of a tight ending. Following Stella Mario and Hirsch, we might consider this an archive of possibility. One that encourages words to make space for counter memories and potentially disrupting memories. It asks us to rethink what constitutes an event or a life of value. And in doing so, has the power to shift the structures of knowledge and intelligibility that archives presume in their institutionalization of knowledge. The collection, the legal collection, also impresses upon us the importance of archive making and caretaking, especially the generation still with us, though passing away and of movements whose histories are still being shaped. In these ways, we might understand a curatorial practice as part of what Cedric Robinson called the Black Radical Tradition, the ongoing cultivation of an ideology of liberation that seeks the could be of black life outside of the systemic privations of which is capitalism. The author's album and the photographic archive from which it comes reveals a life of radical commitments that does not deny
Black Human Ballerina of Dance State of Harlem. And it's my
you know, you should have a conversation with writing some of these note cards, not knowing that she would end up becoming an integral part of the archive. So Ms. Kluge has had her hand in this since the beginning. And we are now just basically the evolution of what her vision for us is. And I still don't know what the end that she had in mind. I would only add that um, over you know, coming through you know, the Middle East, she's very aware of the historical importance of the work. And I think mean, that's something that has been um, consistent about her. She knows that this is something for history, and she wants to build a team, I think, in reaching out to the neighbor. She wants to build a team that she trusts. It's hard. 
the short ones. Um, I mean, I think the archive does a lot of things, and I think the important thing we can start with the way that it's a it's the, 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 that when understanding that the, the the way that we know Kathleen Cleaver, right, is only one part of her life, and it's only one part of the archive, right? Um, so knowing that we you know it's the it's the kind of bulk, right, or it's like a, it's a huge center of it. Um, but that there are generations of photographs that proceed, right? And then photographs that, um, that many photographs that come after until like, you know, last week. So it already disrupts in many ways this question right, of, of what is a life, what is an event, what's important, where, when do we start counting, right? Counting time or counting um, this history. Um, and so I think it already starts to do that. Um, it disrupts time and history and progress in that way, or mission in that way. Um, it also, in the sense of um, thinking more broadly, you said something about, um, oh, about returning to humanity. And I think right, that was you know, the importance um, of, for me, the family album is one of, is the Algernon album is, I think, the first thing, the first thing that I saw in uh, when I first visited. And um, I remember Kathleen being like, oh, we should take all the pictures out of it and put them elsewhere. And I was like, no. <laughs> no, because it is, it is a memoir. It is a story, right? It is a crafted, it's a crafted telling. Um, you know, and in a way that, um, that does hold all of these parts together. Um, and so I think that is, so also sort of taking seriously the, the breadth of that and, and all the kinds of photographs that make a life. So you know, the, the length of time, the kinds of images, um, and I think this is why I go back to Ian Owen in this way about the kind of our, our narratives of resistance and uplift, right? That we want, we often want this narrative of like, you know, do this in my class here. Um, you know, from the from the slave house to the white house, from you know, start from the bottom now here. Right? It's like all these like not um, narratives of teleological progress, and we know, especially in the current moment that we're living in, progress is not a straight line. People backtrack in all kinds of ways, and so how do we um, then also make sense? Um, and then to and then come up with all of that all of the silences that happen around black people in the archives, right? So the silence of not, not being in an archive, but only showing up in certain kinds of ways in the archive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, I'm really trying to take seriously as well, but like, this is an opportunity to try and imagine differently, you know, write a different history. I found myself you know, going back and revising some of the assumptions that I made in the first book, um, thinking, you know, what, what was my investment in telling a particular kind of story? Where, what, what do I do differently? Just kind of why I the rest of the chair. Um, a lot. So I think, you know, I, I, I think all of those things become become possible. And I am really, um, some people earlier, like the two books that I read over when I break that have really been really with me right now are Set of Providence and Black Marxism, uh, The Making of Black Marxism Tradition and Sylvia Hartman's um, way of lots beautiful experiments because they both are trying to re rewrite history that opens up the space for the could be, for like a potential history, right? The history that, that we don't even know exactly what it is. And Sylvia Hartman calls it a dream book for living otherwise. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to imagine. So, um, okay.